suppose I'll start recording the lecture. Because last time we were talking about the linked stack. So we we had built a stack before with an array, and it was it was a specific type stack. Like we had the, the data in the stack was like pointers to integers. But of course, since then we learned about like generics and templates. And we also learned about link structures. So why not build a stack with a link structure? You know, why not? So let's pick back up. Okay. Uh, wait, yes, I am recording. Okay, good. All right. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, so here was like the main idea. And I know we went over this last time, but here's the main idea. I'll have some, some pointer to my stack object and my stack object will keep track of the count and keep track of the top of the stack. It probably makes sense, like, I, I, I mean, I could have the top point, I, I could be adding and removing from like the, the end of the list over here, I, I guess. Like I could start like, I could treat this as the top, but that's, that's a really bad implementation. That's gonna be a lot of extra work. So we're gonna have to go all the way down to the end, insert at the end all the time. So let's just make the top. And then if it's the top, when we push something, we just have to insert at the front. And when we pop, we just remove from the front, which is like the easier things to do in a link structure. Yeah, 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 okay. So where does all the action happen? Yeah, okay, so the top will point to the head. So array stack int. This is what we had before. So we had our max top uh, pointer to pointers to integers. That's like the stack, the array of integer pointers. And we had this expand capacity, which we needed because we want our stack to seem that it can grow infinitely large, but we know that when we implement it, we're gonna have a finite number of, of array locations, array cells, let's say. So if, if the stack ever grows larger than the array is, we'll have the stack object automatically expand capacity so the user of the stack doesn't even need to consider the fact that like, oh, we ran out of space. It's just gonna grow for us. We had our constructors. I guess here we had our, like our not default constructor size. You know, this would specify the size of the stacks, like the array representing the stack. Not really necessary, but whatever, it's there. And then we have our push pop peak size and is empty. Now, oh, and our two string. But with our linked one, you know, I guess we don't have the not default constructor because like, well, what would that be? I don't know but we only need to keep track of the top and the count. Where before, what else did we have? Max tops, ah, see, we need to know the max, you know? Uh, we have our constructors, but we have push, pop, peak, size is empty, and two string. But as we talked about last time, two string can get a little hairy because, well, we don't really necessarily know what our types are. So let's start building this. I, I, I'm still gonna be working in my the same project where I've got like the course, the int nodes, the nodes, the students and whatnot. Just, I'm just gonna keep working here cause it's easy and I already have the node objects defined in here. So I'm gonna create a new add class and we'll call this link stack. All right, cool. So our link stack, what? What's going on here? What? <laughs> Why is the link stack header populated with all this stuff? All right, well, let's just do this. That was strange. Um, so here we go. We're including our string, pragma once, yeah. Okay, template. I just copy pasted the, the header stuff. Now, you'll all remember that the link stack we don't, we're not gonna put anything here because C++ is gonna automatically generate that code for us based on the templates we put in the header. So let's, let's carry on. I should probably stop doing the full screen. Okay, so generic, we're making it generic. So we want all of our stuff to be templates. So what do we want the default constructor to have? Well, we'll make the top a null pointer, something like the, the head is nothing because there's nothing in the stack. So we'll just, yeah, have it point to nothing. And then count equals zero, right? So there's nothing in the stack, so top points to nothing. Makes sense. 
Now our copy constructor. Well, here is where, okay, this is gonna be a little bit more hairy and it's probably gonna be hard to see, but I'll copy and paste this into the, into the code so we can see better and I'll zoom in. So what do we say? Okay, so count, get the original objects count. And if count is zero, well, this is easy. We'll just make the top point to null pointer. If there's nothing in the stack, then I don't need to make top point to anything. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to make a copy of the top and just make a copy all the way down. And this is what we talked about last time. Remember, you might be saying, okay, so this is a deep copy because you're going into the stack and making a copy of all the things in the stack. Well, hold on. The stack is represented by a series of linked nodes. We need to make copy of the nodes, but we're not gonna make copies of the things inside the nodes, like the data, because I don't know if the data is like an integer or an integer pointer. I don't necessarily know how to make a copy of that thing. So I can't do the deep, deep, deep copy here. So I'm just gonna go and copy the default constructor over. There we go. And the copy constructor. So this is what we covered last time. So now we're up to speed. So this is making the copy all the way down. Next, what do we have? I guess I'll, there. Uh, our deconstructor, well, what are we gonna have to do? Well, I'm getting a pointer to the top, calling it to delete. And then I say, well, top is not a null pointer. Top equals tops get next, delete to delete, and then to delete equals top. So it looks like the idea here, I'm just gonna have to make this full screen, I guess, is if I have, oop, there. If I have like top points to this thing, which points to this thing, which points to this thing, which points to, to nothing, let's say, I'm gonna say, okay, 2 del, I'm gonna call it like TD, points to top. And then I ask, if top is not null, Top is now tops get next. So don't point there anymore, point there. Then delete to delete. Oh, okay, so this gets deleted. And then to delete equals top. Okay, don't point there anymore, point there. And then point there. Repeat, okay, da, 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 da. you point here now, we delete this, and then this now points there. Okay, you move next because it's not null. We delete this, awesome. And then we say top, are you null? Yes, oh, we're done. Again, you might be saying, well, hold on, before we were being careful about what we delete. You're right, but we're not deleting the data. We are not saying delete tops data. We are only getting rid of the nodes themselves. We're leaving the data alone. So copy this on over. Oops, I like to have an extra space here. So we're in good shape. Oh, also, I meant to say this earlier. I, uh, I recently discovered on my YouTube page that a weirdly large proportion of my traffic for the YouTube channel is coming from Washington State University. So I was trying to find where on the Washington State University website where they were linking to my YouTube videos. I couldn't find it. So if you are here from Washington State, please let me know because I'm very curious. Happy to have you here. Just wondering how you got here. All right, so there's the deconstructor. So now, okay, push. Re okay, let me ask you this actually before we even talk about push. Do we ever need to expand capacity? I mean, not, no, we don't because we don't have a fixed size. Like the array, we create an array of size 10. If we run out of 10 spots, we'll need to have a bigger array. Here, we just create new nodes indefinitely forever. So we don't need an expand capacity. I mean, expand capacity is like push is kind of automatically doing it for us by creating a new node. So we don't need the expand capacity, which is awesome. So what's happening here? Well, we create a new node. New nodes next points to top. Top is now new node, increase count. That's it. So the thing we're pushing here of type T, this is the data we're pushing. Let's pretend the stack is empty because sometimes and some people might remember from the, the lab, I was talking about edge cases, where edge cases are funny scenarios where like, okay, here's how the code works in general, but what happens if the stack is empty? Or what happens if the array is full? Like those are edge cases, funny little situations that you'll have to deal with in a one-off situation. Important to include, but not the thing that's happening in general. So you might think, well, okay, if I'm pushing onto an empty stack, that's an edge case. 
right? So do I need to handle that edge case in a special way? And with this push, we're actually lucky. We don't need to. Because if we have top, which is pointing to null, let's see what happens. We create a new node, I don't know, new node, which is a pointer to a new node that contains the to push, whatever that is. Then we say new node, your next is is the old top. Well, what is the old top? Well, it's, it's null. And then uh, top, you now point to what new node is. All right, perfect. Great, increase count, great. So we're in perfect shape here. So now let, let's do it again. Let's create a new node, okay, so new node. We're pushing again, the stack has one thing in it. Create a new node with the to push. Your next is now going to point to what top points to. Okay, perfect. And now top, you point to what new node is. All right, perfect, so you'll go there. There, so this is the top, this is the next thing, this is null. So this is that's how the push works, this is awesome. Easy peasy. So I'm gonna copy this code over. A lot of people, when they look at, like you might think like, uh, okay, we're going through this pretty fast, but that's like, I suppose we are, don't get me wrong, we are. But like, look, push is one, two, three, four lines of code. If you understand the idea of the link structure, this is easy. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not easy to wrap your head around link structure in the first place. So the important part here is make sure you understand linked structures. Otherwise, this is going to be hairy. But it really ends up being this simple in the end. Again, simple doesn't mean trivial, but it's relatively simple. And if you feel like you understand the link structure, but this is like, wait, what? Slow down. Like, hold on. Chances are you're overthinking it. And I know I sound like a broken record, but honestly, like I'm doing, draw it. It wasn't until during, I was, it was in second year university in my equivalent of like 255, where I finally got an appreciation for the value of drawing out what's happening in the code. And once I discovered that, computer science got so much easier. I know I sound like a broken record. I know you're thinking, yeah, yeah, okay, I should draw it. No, no, for real, draw these ideas. I ended up after second year, I bought myself a whiteboard because I was going through so much paper. So I got a whiteboard and whiteboard markers and just was doing everything. It, it was so important, it helped me a lot. Okay, so here's our push and what's pop gonna look like? Well, just like with the array, if it's empty, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna deal with popping from an empty stack? Should we just do nothing? Should the program crash? So should we, does it mean something catastrophically bad has happened? Like, I don't know. As the programmer of the stack, I don't know. But if I write this stack and someone else 10 years from now wants to use my code for the stack, I don't know what they're gonna wanna do if they try to pop from an empty stack. But I throw this exception as a way to let them know that they have to deal with an empty stack however they want. So they will catch the exception and then write their code to work in the way they need it to. So if they feel like, oh no, if, if, if I'm using the stack, if I feel like the program needs to crash immediately because something bad has happened and I don't want the program to keep executing, then they'll catch the exception and just have the program stop. Or maybe it's no big deal, okay? Oh, okay, I'll catch the exception, but basically ignore it and move on. Whatever. Now I heard a boop. How does the computer know how a stack we have, wait, how does the computer know how a stack we have made is empty or not? I'm guessing if it points to null pointer. Well, spoiler, yeah, <laughs> because uh, uh, is empty. Look, we have count. We could also say if top is equal to null pointer, that would also work. But remember, we have the count variable. And if the count is zero, so this is the function is empty, we're calling right here. And yeah, like, uh, like it was just suggested, that could have been as easy as like, if top is null pointer, that would also have worked. Uh, does anyone here today have come with their special, it looks like no one showed up with their special usernames. Ah, you all joined with your real names. That's horrible. All right, anyways. So if it's empty, throw an exception, but let's assume it's not empty. So here's what we're gonna do. 
And let's draw it out. Let's say I have a, it's not empty. So we have top points to some node that has some data in it, which points to another node that has some data in it, and then who, who cares? So what I'm gonna do, all right, create a new node pointer and have it point to the top. So DN oh, for delete node, point there. Get the data from delete node. So whatever this is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save this. So popped is whatever the data is, the question mark, because that's what we're gonna wanna return, right? That's this, the thing we're popping off the stack. We're not returning the node that contains the data. We're containing the data. And that's important because with the array, when we pop, we return the data. We want the link structure to work the exact same way. When you pop, return the data. How does the stack return the data? Well, that depends on if it's an array or if it's a link structure. Does that matter to the person using the stack? It shouldn't. In the sense that it shouldn't for how I interface with it. You might have some design decisions on like, well, it might be more efficient to use this, a link structure or a, an array structure in a certain scenario. But how I use it, whenever I pop, it's got to return the data. All right, so we just got the data that we're going to want to return. So this part here, this is what we will be returning. Ooh, this important bit here. Top is now pointing to next. So you don't point there anymore. You're going to point to the next. Decrease the count. Okay. Delete to delete. Okay, this is gone. And then return whatever popped was. There we go. We have to make sure to delete the node because we're using like dynamically allocated stuff. We got to make sure to delete the node. We're not deleting the data. We're deleting the node. And peak is going to be basically the same, but way easier. Just if it's empty, return that exception. Otherwise, just get the data from the top. We don't need to delete anything. We don't need to remove it. We don't need to do anything. This is just returning the top, the data from the top. Size, return count. If is it empty, count equals zero. Again, this could have been top null pointer. That, that would have worked as well because if top is null pointer, that means the count is also zero. And then two string. Actually, hold on, before I do that, I've skipped a lot of this stuff. Did I, what did I put in here last? Push, all right, I guess I need my, whoop. I need my pop. Let's get peak. Size. is empty. Now two string. Two string, we run into a bit of a problem. And this was brought up last time by someone. I don't remember who brought it up, but a question was raised. Well, how the heck are we going to do two string if we don't know what the type T is? And you're absolutely right. This is one of those things where we're actually in trouble because if it's an object I already wrote and I implemented the two string like I should have, like a student object, I can just call the student objects two string. It'll return the string version of that object. But you remember, that if I had an integer pointer and if I want to get the string version of an integer, I call the standard libraries to string. So that's not going to work in general. So we're in trouble. But like we talked about last time, other programming languages have a clever way of dealing with this. And the clever way is just enforcing that every object has a two string, whether you write it or not, it exists. So if you ever call an object to string, it's guaranteed that that method exists. In C++, we don't have that guarantee. So we're actually kind of out of luck here. So we'll skip this two string. And then other than that, it's time to test. So I'm just gonna go and just copy all this stuff here. I'm gonna go back to my, what was my hello world? Okay. I'm gonna delete all this. There. I'm gonna make a link stack. Oh, I guess I should probably also LMN, okay. I've got like a fuzz that keeps tickling my nose. Ooh. Link stack. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to create a link stack. Zoom in a little bit more. Call it stack. And it's going to have integers on it. Not integer pointers, just regular integers. Why? Because I'm lazy. 
All right, now let's keep going. And then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna wanna push a whole bunch of things. I'm gonna push the numbers zero through nine. And then after I do that, we should see, well, first I create the stack, the size should be empty, or pardon me, the size should be zero and it should say it's empty. I'll push 10 things onto the stack, zero through nine, size should be 10, is empty should be false or zero. Then I'm going to test peak. I'm going to make a copy of the stack by calling the copy constructor. I'm going to test the original pop. And how are we going to do that? Well, I'm going to say, well, the stack is not empty. Keep popping stuff and print it out. And then once the stack is empty, we'll, we'll stop popping. And we'll say, okay, uh, what's your size? Should be zero. Is empty. Should be one. Because it is empty. All right. And then make sure the copy is left alone. This is important. We need to make sure that our copy wasn't affected by modifying the original stack. So this will make sure that that's still good. And what do we have here? Well, the copy stack is not empty. Pop everything. Okay. This is just the same as the other one, except we're, instead of doing it on the stack, we're doing it on copy stack. And I'll delete everything in the end. I guess I could also check the exceptions, but I'm lazy. Let's, let's not do that right now. So what are we going to do? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build this and I'm going to run it. And we're going to go through each bit just to make sure everything checks out. I sh probably should have had some prints to say what we're doing where, but uh, array max is uninitialized. Uh, count identifier not found. What, where? Link stack. Oh. See if that fixes everything. It looks good. But while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to go back and uh, there. Much better. All right, let's hit run. And what do we see? Well, there's a lot going on. So, hello world. So the first two things we should see is zero and one. Zero, one. Awesome. We push 10 things, we should see 10 and zero. 10, zero, awesome. Peak at the top, what do we see? It's a nine. What's the size? It's still 10. Is it empty? No. Make a copy, all right. Peak at the top of the copy, Still, it's nine. There's 10 things on it, it's not empty. All right, so we are now here. Now, while the stack isn't empty, keep popping. All right, so we pop the nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. And then after we pop the zero, it's now empty. So we stop this, we stop this loop, and we say, okay, what's your size? It's zero. Are you empty? One. Awesome. Check to make sure the copy was left alone. Well, the top of the copy is still nine. There's still 10 things on it and it's not empty. Good stuff. Well, the copy is not empty. Uh, pop and print it out. So we should see nine through zero. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We stop once it's empty. What's the size? It's zero. Is it empty? One. It's true. Yes, it is. Awesome. We're in good shape and then we delete everything because we're good programmers. There, that's it. Are there any questions about the linked stack before we move on? Uh, I'm, I'll guess that everyone's a-okay with it, but if you imagine for a second that I, oh, what's going on here? This fluff is killing me. If you imagine for a second that I had implemented, that, now this is important here, pay attention. Imagine I had implemented, like I know we made the int array stack, wherever it is, I guess it's not in here. Uh, but remember how I made the int array stack. Imagine for a second I made an array stack where the array stack, it was generic. So I, I could use it just like this. If that existed, I should be able to immediately change which implementation of the stack I'm using by modifying one line of code. If I modify this line of code, 
And again, pretend that he erased the erase stack was implemented and it was generic. If I did this, pretend erase stack exists. If I changed it to this, all of this code. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Once again, I think I'd have this figured out by now. We can't see what you're doing. Boop. Yes. All right. Let me start over again. <laughs> so. If you pretend for a second I had a ray stack implemented and it was generic. If I come and change this line of code from link stack, so what do I have? I have a link stack object called stack. If I were to go here and again, pretend a ray stack is implemented and we've, we've done this. Pretend it exists. I know it doesn't, but pretend it does. If I did this, all of this code will work the exact same. Well, I guess this would have to also be a red. I lied, two lines of code. All of this would work exactly the same because I ask a co like stack peak size is empty. The stack, like it doesn't matter if this is a linked or an array because both have is empty. Both have size, both have peak. This would work just the same. This would work just the same. This would work just the same. How they work in the back will be different, but how I interact with the stacks stays the same. So I could go and just, and everything else, except for these two lines of code, the array stack copy and the array stack here for the original stack will be exactly the same. And it'll work just fine. Isn't that interesting? And it's that where we talk about the interface the way I interface is independent from the implementation. The interface is identical for both implementations of the stack. I just, the, I can immediately change out which version of the stack I'm using by going array. If the array stack was implemented in here, which it's not, but it could be. And I think that's actually this week's lab, I think. Isn't that neat? I think it's neat. It wasn't until like I saw this in my, like when I was learning where there was like a big click moment where it's like, oh wow, good design. Look how easy that we can make these transitions and switch from one implementation to another implementation and it doesn't affect my interfacing with that object. That's awesome. Are there any questions about what we just learned or what I just talked about? All right, uh, that's easy then. Okay, so next what we're gonna do is start talking a little bit more about computational complexity. You may remember if you were in 162 or, or 161 with me, we talked a little bit about computational complexity, but this will be a big review and we're gonna go into much more detail about it. And I did hear the boop, just give me a second while this loads, so it loads on the right virtual desktop. So do you just not usually include two string in a template? That's my solution. If this was if this was Java, I would always have the two string and I would implement it. Uh, but with C++, because we run into these issues, we're, we're kind of in trouble. Uh, okay, computational complexity. Often when we talk about what it means for one algorithm to be better than the other, it's when we're talking about complexity analysis and there's different types of complexity al analysis. There's like uh, time complexity analysis, there's space complexity analysis, there's processor complexity analysis. There's a lot of different types of complexity analysis. And the one that we will start talking about is computational, the time complexity. And this is the idea of, you might remember, if I'm doing a linear search, if I have an array of size n, and I want to search through that array to see if something exists in that array. Now get ready to type the answer in the chat. I want to have a look. If I have an array of size n, and I want to know if a given thing exists inside that array, how many things do I need to look at to guarantee whether or not I will know, in the worst case scenario, whether or not I will know if that thing exists in that array of size n? Everybody type it in the chat. Half, false, n, all of them. We have to look at all of them because 
I won't know if something doesn't exist in the array until I've looked at everything in the array. So I have to look at all of them. What if I looked at, what if I doubled the size of the array? Okay, so now the array is 2n. By doubling the size of the array, how much, how many things do I need to look at? Now, type it in the chat. 2n, exactly. So, what is the ratio? So, I just doubled the size of the array. So, I doubled n. And by do doubling n, I doubled the amount of work I need to do. So, this is... This is what we're talking about. This is this is the realm of where we're talking. Now, a lot of people will start getting huffy. and they, they can't see the forest through the trees. They can't see the big picture. They'll say like, well, okay, I know that this algorithm is, they're both linear time algorithms, and I'll, I'll show you examples of this. They're both linear time algorithms, but I know this one's a little bit faster than this one. So this one's obviously better. And although you're not wrong, what we care about when talking about computational complexity is how does the algorithm, how much work does the algorithm have to do as a function of n? Not like an absolute number, but how does it grow relative to the input size? That's an important key thing we care about here. Uh, I will reiterate this as we go through the lecture slides where it comes up. Okay, let's say, hold on. I want to give you another example. Ah, no, we'll just go through the slides. So, point of this lecture, what is computational complexity? How to analyze an algorithm's goodness? And, like, is your algorithm practical? And what makes an algorithm good? Is your algorithm better than your friends, or is it the same? These are the questions we're going to ask about. So, how many and how much resources does your algorithm need? This is the big question we're asking. And... We're going to focus on computational complexity, but there's also space complexity too, which becomes an issue. You might think, well, in today's world, you know, we've got massive amounts of RAM in our computer and storage, so we don't really care so much about the space complexity if we get some speed ups in terms of comp like time complexity, which might be true for your purposes. But if you're like Google or Amazon or Facebook and you're, 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 the amount of information you have is just catastrophically large, space complexity can end up becoming very important. So yeah, how much resources does your computer need? CPU, memory, how many processors? Uh, so often we want to know how much time your algorithm is going to take relative to the input size. Again, this is the important bit. It's not like an absolute number. It's how does it change relative to the input size? So with a linear search, if we doubled the size of the array, we had to do twice as much work. It growed linearly. We often call this time complexity analysis. And when we know how much time we expect a certain algorithm to take, it can help us choose the right tool for the job. And we'll see some examples of this because when we start talking about different implementations of things, when we start talking about like, well, we have our stack, to implement, our stack implementation versus our, our, pardon me, our array implementation of a stack versus linked implementation of a stack. An array implementation of a queue, a linked implementation of a queue. Maybe one's better than the other in certain scenarios and vice versa. And we'll talk about this. So time complexity. We base this on the size of the input, the number of operations we need to do. The number of operations is kind of maybe not as well defined as you might like, but this is kind of like a, a unit of work. And there's a bit of an art to kind of understanding what a unit of work is, but it's, it's not as hard as, as it might seem at first. And there are a couple of tricks we do when doing computational analysis, but like everything else in computer science, Really, the only real trick is to follow the base set of rules and what do the base set of rules tell you? Just use the base set of rules and you're good to go. Yeah, okay. All right, so we want to know the relationship between the size of the input n, the time it, take, it will take to solve the problem, t of n. Notice that t of n is a function of n. This means that the amount of time taken will depend on the size of the input. Now, we might start getting uh, into a bit of an argument over like, well, you're saying like, well, it's the, time it, it's the time it will take when really I'm talking about like the number of like steps it takes and you're right, but let's not get too bogged down by those details at this point. So the growth function, we call T of N the growth function. 
So just like any other function, if I had the function like f of x equals x, and I told you to plot that, you would go, okay, well, just, just change the color. Whoop. Blue. If I told you to plot this, it would look like this. If we had x squared, it would look like this, right? This is just function plotting. You, this should not be new. This should not be crazy ideas. So t of n is the growth function. And here's an arbitrary example. 15n squared plus 45n. I could plot that, right? It's simple. It's like it's two-dimensional. Not crazy. Uh, ew, math. I thought we were doing comp sci course. Yes, this is a joke. Hold on. I've got I've got a joke for this. Wait, wait, wait. There. Let me let me hide. <laughs> yeah, I got bad news. <laughs> Computer science. We. We've been tricking you into doing math this whole time. Uh, a lot of people think like, like don't get too bogged down about what you think math is because you know, I know you're thinking back in high school math, that's like calculus and like statistics and whatnot. And that's absolutely true. But math is a huge field, like discrete math, combinatorics, probability. There's, there's a lot of different things. And I didn't particularly like things like calculus, but I liked programming and I liked computer science. So anyways, Way for me to go way into detail on your silly little joke. But anyways. <laughs> All right. So 15n squared plus 45n. Oh, and by the way, don't worry. As good computer scientists, we're going to simplify the math to the extreme. So don't worry too, too much. So we can plot this. Don't worry about where this number came from. I literally pulled it out of thin air. Okay. It's just some arbitrary numbers. We'll check that out later where we could, like how we can derive where this would come from for a particular chunk of code. But let's pretend we have a chunk of code that I did all some magic analysis for and I, I came up with this little expression. I, let's, let's look. Let's break this down into the parts, okay? So I'm gonna, let's break it down into, let's go back to red, this bit, this bit, and then we'll like do it all together. So if n is one, what is the first bit? Well, that's 15 times one squared. Well, that's just 15. If n is two, well, what's two squared? That's four, four times 15, that's 60. What if n is five? Well, that's uh, five squared is 25 times 15. I guess that's 375 and so on. I'm just gonna keep doing this all the way down. And we'll see like, if this is a function, we can see how this grows. And you can imagine, I can plot this, right? Imagine I have like my plot and down here I've got n and here I've got t of n, right? Basic function, Ooh. I could plot this, like, okay, one's at 15, I don't know, maybe that's like here. And then we go like 60, and then 370, I don't know, it's, it's gonna go pretty rapidly, <laughs> like that. But let's look at the 45 n. So let's look at this chunk of the function. So well, n is one, it's 45, which is interesting because like 45 is, I mean, that's bigger than 15. When n is two, well, 90 is bigger than 60, but as soon as we hit like n is five, we see that suddenly this becomes the dominating term. And for those of you at least who didn't hate their functions course in high school, you'll know that if you, when you see something squared, you know that it's gonna grow much quicker than something that's just not squared, right? Something that's just n. So we know, and we should expect that this part here is gonna grow much, 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 much faster. And when we go all the way down to 1 million, look, this is like what? Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so that's a million, a billion, a trillion. This part here, when, when n is 1 million, 15n squared is 15 trillion. And now down here, when n is 1 million, 45n is just 45 million. Look, this is, this is so much bigger. This is, or, this is orders of magnitude bigger. Look. When you add them together and you look at the whole function, look at this, look. The 45 million, although a big number, becomes inconsequential to the whole thing. To the whole function, that 45n is almost meaningless. It's this part that dominates. This part here, ugh, I'm scraping all over my, the important information. But it's that part there that dominates. So, it's almost like this part here doesn't even matter. In fact, it starts to matter less and less and less as 
and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Let me show you what I mean. And I got to keep an eye on the time here because I know we're getting close to running out. Let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to open up a calculator. Yep. All right. So let's have a look here. If I do... So, okay, let's look at which proportion 45N makes up of the whole thing here. So let's do 45... 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, divided by 1, 5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 4, 5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. It makes up 2.99 times 10 to the negative 6 of the whole thing. 2.99 times 10 to the negative 6. Someone write that down. That's hilariously small. Okay? But let's see what happens when we... Here, I'm going to write down here. 2.99 e negative 6. Okay, so that's that's at 1 million. Let's see if I make this a, a 10 million. Okay, so what happens if I do... So that's just going to be 450 million. So that's 450 million divided by... Uh, oh, man, I'm going to have to go scientific, right? Ah, look at that. Four five zero 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 zero. So this will be the part at 10 million, 45 times 10 million. And I'm just going to divide it by, and I'm just going to plug in the whole expression. 15 times 10 million, one zero 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 zero. Close bracket to the squared plus 45 times 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Did I do that right? I fear I didn't. 1, 2, one, two 3, 4, 5, 6. Yeah, that can't be right. I must have done something wrong here. Ugh. 15. Okay, let's do 10, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 squared, right? times 15 plus 450000000. So that's the total. Copy all that and let's do 450000000 divided by that. Ah, there we go. The next time when we increased it to 10 million, the amount that the 45n mattered got even smaller. So as n grows, this becomes increasingly inconsequential. And often when we're talking about computational complexity, we, we like to think about n as some hilariously and arbitrarily large number. Pretend it's like the biggest friggin' number in the world. So when that n gets big, and gets even bigger and bigger and bigger, this part here, the 45N, becomes, like, it'll eventually approach 0%, right? Because it's just, it's so inconsequential. So let me plot these things. I'm going to go and plot 45N. Well, if I do that, it's, I mean, first of all, look at the scale here. So this goes up to 10,000, I guess. And this goes up times 10 to the 13. So 1, 1. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Uh, wait, okay, so we got decimal. 1, 2, is that right? Did I plot this right? Well, whatever. Let's, let's not worry about the scale right now. The point is, it's the shape of these curves. If I plot 45n, it's basically flat. I mean, I know if I plot this, it should look something like this. But when you compare that to the thing that grows, like 15n squared, 15n squared grows so much faster that this part here looks flat. And you'll notice, by the way, let me uh, clear this page, clear. You'll notice that 45n, or pardon me, 15n squared and 15n squared plus 45n. Let me ask you, like, where's the blue line? 
can you see the blue line on here? You can't. You know why? Because the green line is perfectly on top of it at this scale. The point is, this 45N, when N grows increasingly large, this 45N becomes so inconsequential that you can't even tell the difference between the blue and the green lines. So, when we care about computational complexity, we are, we start to really only care about what we call the dominating term. So I don't really want to go any further today because at that point we're going to start, we're going to end at a bad break point. But the important bit here is n is going to grow and we look at the part of the growth function. And again, I, I know that we haven't talked about where, the, where I came up with this growth function. We will look at that shortly. Uh, we'll get to that tomorrow. But when we look at these growth functions, we only care about the dominating term because the non-dominating terms become so inconsequential that we just don't, we ignore them. Also, we will learn that we don't even care about like coefficients because we're that lazy in computer science. And we'll say like, well, this function grows like n squared. Where like 100 times n squared is clearly worse than n squared. It'll grow faster than n squared but the growth of the function is the same. And 100 n squared would pale in comparison to n cubed and so on. So that's the takeaway. Are there any last questions before we end for today? Okay, I'll, I'll take that as a no. Uh, otherwise, I will talk to you all tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your day. And, oh, oh I hear a question. Oh yeah, you're just waving. Okay, see ya.